Hello, Science Cafe people. Good evening. Good evening. I am, my name is Bob Rocha. I'm the Associate Curator of Science and Research at the New Bedford Whaling Museum. I am part of a team that puts together the Science Cafes. This is, this is our final event for this season. We'll be back in September at a location TBD. But in the meantime, if you like what you hear tonight, I have a very formal sign-up sheet on the, little, on the table over there. You can sign up, give us your name and email address, or if you want to go online, either via our Facebook page or our website, New Bedford Science Cafe, you can do that. Let's, yes, let me introduce our speaker to you. So, Nicholas P. Sullivan, known to many of you as Nico, is a writer and editor focusing on the impact of business and technology on international development. The Blue Revolution is his fourth book. If you want to learn more about that, there is an interview on New Bedford Light that was done recently. That's, that, was, that was a good one. Um, Sullivan is currently a senior fellow at the Fletcher School's Council on Emerging Market Enterprises and a senior research fellow at its Maritime Studies program. He has twice been a Rockefeller Foundation Bellagio Center resident fellow, a graduate of Harvard University and the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. He lives in Dartmouth, Massachusetts. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Nico Sullivan. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you, Bob. Thank you, Anne. Uh, thank you, Michelle. And uh, thank you all for coming on short notice. Um, so most of my uh, writing over the past 40 years has been about uh, technology and entrepreneurship and international development. But I did write about fishing in the 1970s when I was in college. And you could see the uh, Russian and U East European factory ships off the shores of Cape Cod. And I went to Chatham to talk to the fishermen there who had started a cooperative to fight off the, the Russian factory ships. And then I came to New Bedford to talk to the fishermen who didn't care about what the fishermen in Chatham were doing. They just were, they were fine. Uh, and I was at that point taken by the kind of iconic nature of fishermen, you know, free market, rugged individualist, no government subsidies like dairy farmers or beef farmers. Um, but now 40 years later, I come back to it with the question, where are the fish going to come from to feed the world? Because uh, fish consumption is growing twice as fast as the world population. The world population is growing pretty fast. Three billion in 1960, seven billion now, 10 billion in 2050. Uh, and so the other thing I realized when I got in, into this is that uh, there's some pretty negative perceptions of both wild capture fishing and um, fish farming. And Barton Seaver, who is a chef and seafood, sustainable seafood advocate, wrote a blurb for the back of my book, uh, says that seafood is the only protein considered guilty until proven innocent. And I think that is pretty true. And so in addition to answering the question, where are the fish going to come from? Um, I also kind of set out to rewrite the narrative. And to me, the negative perceptions date to the 1990s. So I started the book in New Bedford in the 1990s when the cod and scallop populations were in deep decline. Um, you know, you remember in Newfoundland in 92, the, the Canadians shut down cod fishing overnight and 30,000 people were out of business. Uh, in the U.S., we limped along for 20 years before it got shut down. Uh, the scallop industry is kind of the inverse, um, and a lot of it has to do with um, School for Marine Science and Technology, right over there somewhere. Uh, they, all the scallop beds were closed. There were undersized scallops. Uh, the scallopers were dredging up yellowtail flounder, which was in distress. So the beds were, were shut down. Uh, the fishermen were losing boats. Um, they started a fisheries survival fund. They went to Brian Rothschild, who is the new dean of the new school, SMAST, and said, you've got to help us. 
And Brian went to NOAA and said, I've got a bunch of uh, scholars in New Bedford who are willing to help with surveys. And so it was an unusual collaboration of fishermen, scientists, and uh, f federal regulators who did all these surveys and which led to the opening of the, um, the scallop beds. And the key thing, the pivotal thing, was the introduction of this underwater camera on a pyramidal rig that was dragged along the sea bottom to take pictures and show vividly where the scallops were and what size they were. And that led to the opening of the beds and the idea of rotating beds uh, based on what you could see on the sea floor. So the scallop industry went from being dead in the water to what is now a 500, $550 million business. Um, so the 90s led to a lot of changes in regulations. Obviously, the restrictions kept getting uh, stiffer and stiffer. Uh, the idea of bycatch was introduced in 90, 1996, which had the original Magnuson-Stevens Act that governed fisheries had not covered. Um, there was another rewrite in 2007, switching to cat shares. But the end result of all that is, you know, if in 2020, looking back, there are more ground fish than there were 25 years ago. Uh, 45 or 47 U.S. stocks that were closed for rebuilding have been rebuilt and were opened up again. So the last two decades uh, have been better for the fish than the fishermen um, because there was a lot of consolidation in the fleets. A lot of fishermen did lose boats because the catch shares, the catch quotas were basically given out to a small group of people based on their catch records. And so we went from what was kind of a tragedy of the commons with the intense fishing pressure to a kind of what we have now, almost a privatization of the ocean because not that many people have the permits or quotas. That's why I say it's been better for the fish than the fishermen. And one thing interesting about bycatch I mentioned, you know, in 96 when the flounder were being scooped up by the scallopers, and now uh, fishermen are targeting haddock, which is quite abundant, and for which they have a lot of quota. But the cod and haddock swim together, they're cousins. So if you're targeting haddock, you have to avoid cod, which is very hard to do. So as a result, uh, fishermen are only catching about 10 to 15 percent of the allowable cat rate. So they're leaving a lot of good fish in the water, a lot of money in the water. Um, so it's just an example of how complex the whole fishing policy is. You know, NOAA is regulating or uh, overseeing 450 stocks nationally and they you know they all have they're all very different they're all in different regions they all have different climates uh, different types of boats and um, so fishermen really are you know in addition to being uh, master navigators and hunters also have to be uh, almost loyally to understand the regulations the other thing that's happened in terms of the transformation of the industry over the last 20 years is the traceability and um, uh, transparency. Now, some of that is a result of what transpired in New Bedford uh, not so long ago with Carlos Rafael and the mislabeling and misreporting of the type of fish and the money not reporting the money. The idea of a fisherman kind of going off grid, off the books, and then getting spending four years in jail for it, I think really was a big wake-up call for the industry and probably as big a psychological hit to the solar plexus as the shutdown of the cod industry had been, you know, in the 90s and early 2000s. And so the whole idea of traceability is a big deal now. And uh, now in, New, in uh, New Bedford, the auction is uh, working with Legit Fish, Fish, which is a Boston-based um, blockchain uh, company that is tracing fish from the from the auction. They're also doing it in Gloucester. And so now 50% or more than half of the scallops that are coming out of New Bedford are, have blockchain tracing on them. And they're moving into other species. At the same time, um, 
other people are using QR codes, not so much to blockchain. By the blockchain tracing I'm talking about, you get it from the harvester to the processor to the um, distributor to the retailer, and you can track everywhere the fish has been. Uh, other people, like Red's Best in Boston, I don't know if anyone knows that company, which is a great, um, great company, Jared Auerbach, who's not a fisherman, he's an aggregator. He goes around to docks all over New England and um, picks up fish, any kind of fish, and then finds a market for them. He uses QR codes not to trace everywhere uh, the fish has been, because people trust him, but to tell a story about the fisherman. So you can use the QR code and it pops up the, the name of the boat, the captain, the location, the type of fish, the type of vessel. And so he, he's into storytelling. And a lot of other people are doing that now. There's a, there's a new company in New Bedford called No Seafood, which is combining the storytelling with the blockchain. And again, they're going direct to consumer. So that's another thing that has really changed in the industry. Um, is the connection between the producer, the fisherman, and the consumer. They've traditionally been very separate. You know, the fishermen are at sea, Route 18 cuts them off from the land lovers, and there's, you know, you go into a supermarket, you don't know where the fish has come from. Now, with QR codes, now with people selling direct to consumers, there's a stronger, and the local catch network, which started in 2008, there are now 500 local catch community-supported fisheries um, across the United States. There's a much stronger connection. Um, and to me, I think that uh, consumer demand is a really big part of um, changing the industry. To say we are demanding sustainable fish, we want to know where it's come from, we want to know how it's been treated, and, um, and, and we're willing to pay money for that because there's a value we ascribe a value to, to knowing that um, so Barton Siever to quote Barton Siever again the one who talked said about seafood's the only protein considered guilty uh, he also said there's nothing unsustainable about fishing the only thing that's unsustainable is consumer demand and consumers really have kind of a misplaced uh, the majority of seafood Americans eat is farmed shrimp and scallops, I mean shrimp and salmon from the other side of the world and canned tuna from the other side of the world. It's like 65% of the seafood that Americans eat. And um, so something is going to happen to break that kind of um, skewed distribution system because the U.S. has a, a $17 billion seafood trade deficit when in fact we know there's great seafood in all parts of the U.S. because we have the second most ocean territory of any country in the world. Um, another thing that is changing is the idea of um, uh, utilization of fish because most fish, 40% of it is waste, you know, skeleton, bones, head. So this movement started in Iceland with an ocean cluster which is like a Silicon Valley cluster, a Hollywood cluster, a Detroit car cluster. You get a, a bunch of companies together that are focused on one thing and you get great ideas out of it. Uh, so it's basically an incubator on the docks in Reykjavik um, with companies that are not in the fishing business, but they're trying to make use of the parts of the fish that are, not, that are typically thrown away. So they're doing fish skin wallets, uh, salmon skin, cod skin wallets, purses, dresses. Uh, and the one that is amazing is the, um, uh, the company called Kerasis up by the Arctic Circle, which has patented a technique for um, scaling codfish, taking the skin, washing it in a mild de de detergent, and then turning it into bandages for diabetic wounds, battlefield wounds, um, uh, breast reconstruction, spinal injuries, and it's tr proven to be faster and more reliable, and does not, and with no ch no chance of infection compared to other bandages. So that they can use, they can get one, they can get eight bandages from one cod fish, and they sell them for five hundred dollars each. So that's four thousand dollars for from 
the skin of one fish. So that's obviously an extreme example, but um, it's also an example of the way to increase value from fish, which re will restrict fishing pressure because there'll be less demand, I mean, pressure to make money from the fish. But there's other ways to make the money. Um, so I mentioned a, um, Kevin Stokesbury and his underwater cameras. He's now doing something that is very interesting um, in terms of technology, is surveying codfish. And he's been tracking, in particular, the class of 19 cod. Um, he's got an open trawl net with cameras and sensors in it, and you can see the, the fish flowing through the net. They're, most surveys, you haul the fish up on board, you dump them out, count them, weigh them, size them. But this, way, this is all done with machine learning algorithms. You can see it, the fish going through, and you can tell the type and size of fish. And to find out how many of fish there really are, they do collect some fish and they tag them. And then they put them back in the ocean and then they trawl and trawl again, and they have these passive responders in the trawl net to pick up the tag. And they can say, well, the fish we caught are only 10% of the fish out there, or they're 50% of the fish out there. <clears throat> so it's a way of determining the efficiency of the net and how many fish are out there. Um, <laughs> There's another, another thing in terms of getting more value from the fish. There's a, uh, there's a company in Portland, Maine, pract called True Fin, practicing uh, this technique called ikajeme. Ikajeme, it's a Japanese technique. Uh, called, it means killing with purpose. And you catch a fish and you sp spike the brain, you cut the spinal cord, a fast kill, a fast bleed, there's no fight. And it's so, it's, it preserves the integrity of the flesh and the firmness of the flesh. And this woman who started it from the Gulf of Maine Research Institute said, you know, fishermen are coming in with mackerel and, and they're selling them for 20 or 30 cents a pound. No one, and they're using it for bait. Meanwhile, the high-end restaurants in Portland and Boston are buying mackerel from Japan at $23 a pound. And it's the same fish. And it's because it's... Dave used this technique in Japan. So she's now buying fish, not just mackerel, but all kinds of fish, uh, Portland down to Gloucester, I believe, and that is killed using this technique, which is labor intensive, obviously. It's a, like single kill, but fishermen are getting much more uh, higher price for their fish. Um, okay, what, that's wild fish. Uh, farm fish. Uh, so aquaculture is the fastest forming, fastest growing form of food production in the world. And mariculture or marine aquaculture is the fastest growing form of aquaculture. And now 52% of the fish consumed in the world are farmed. Uh, many of them, of course, are freshwater, carp, tilapia, but more and more are uh, marine species and you know there was a slogan back in the 90s maybe even later than that saying fish uh, friends don't let friends eat farm fish because it's bad stuff it's dirty farming etc uh, but 70 percent of aquaculture is or mariculture is shellfish and kelp the seaweed which are both very good for the water and they don't take any food they just take nutrients kelp absorbs CO2. So the idea that farm or aquaculture is bad is really not true. There, have, there obviously were some bad cases of salmon farming in Norway in the 90s. But now, um, all the new finfish farms in the US, and most of them in Norway and other places, are based on land, so they in these big recirculating tanks. So they've taken the fish out of the water. There's no chance of escapement. There's no chance of um, environmental degradation. Um, there's no chance of uh, disease jumping from farm fish to wild fish. And in, New in, 
there are three new salmon farms going into Maine alone. Uh, I think they're mostly Norwegian com uh, companies. Uh, the oldest, these systems are called recirculating aquaculture systems. The oldest one was started in 91 in Western Massachusetts by a Hampshire College graduate. You're Hampshire College? <laughs> Josh Goldman. Do you know that name? No. Anyway, he was class of 80, mid 80s, he graduated sometime. He, um, to grow barramundi, that farm is still there, and the barramundi is sent to, um, is shipped to Asian markets in Toronto, Boston, New York, and Vancouver. There's a new eel farm, there's a Branzino farm in Waterbury, Connecticut. It's excellent fish. Um, where did I see that the other day? I think they sell it in Westport now. Um, uh, there's a kingfish farm. Anyway, it's, it's, it's a, a new thing. And the, the holy grail for uh, mariculture is offshore farming. To get away from the near shore, to go offshore into federal waters beyond the three mile limit hasn't really happened in the US. There are a lot of people, it's very hard to get a permit but the Norwegians and the Chinese are doing it. The Norwegians are building basically what, like oil rigs out at sea for fish farms. The Chinese have built a ship that is twice as long as the Titanic, which is all, it's got like 80 fish tanks in it. They're growing fish. They're pumping in salt water, pumping it out. So the U.S. has 1% it's the fastest growing form of food production in the world. The U.S. has 1% of the market, and we have a huge seafood trade deficit. So something's going to change. Uh, okay, two last things. Um, so I focus mostly, I didn't say this at the beginning, but I focus mostly on New England with some obviously looking out to other parts of the world. The two biggest cha global challenges are, uh, you know, illegal fishing, IUU fishing, and climate change. The illegal fishing uh, is estimated to be 30% of the fish or marine life that is caught is illegal. Um, however, there is a new, uh, well, it's about five years old, there's a, a thing now called Global Fishing Watch, which is tracking in real time on the internet uh, fishing vessels. And they can tell based on their movements whether they're kind of uh, trans-shipping or offloading their illegal catch to other ships. And that has led to a lot of um, arrests and uh, indictments and sinking of ships. Um, and the U.S. FDA is expected in um, this year to, uh, man later this year is supposed to mandate uh, tech-enabled traceability. And one of the reasons for that is they want to see what's coming into the country and um, from the point of harvest. Um, and again, that, the tech-enabled part is probably going to be a blockchain, but it, I guess it doesn't have to be. Um, of course, the big problem with um, policing this stuff is the size of the ocean and the small number of boats that are out there. But most of the illegal fishing is concentrated in a few areas and done by a few countries. And using this kind of real-time internet tracking, you, you, can, you can follow that. Okay, cl climate change. <clears throat> uh, here's a quote from John Hare, who's the um, head of NOAA Research in Woods Hole. He said, we long thought about um, codfish stocks from the perspective of fishing pressure, but now it's from a perspective of climate, habitat, and fishing pressure. So much of the last 20 years, we were trying to rebuild cod without considering climate, but now it's one of the main theories for why cod is not rebuilding. And they do think that the cod are not surviving. The juveniles, not enough of them are surviving to adulthood, to spawn, or the... But Stokesbury thinks there's an improvement, so we'll see what he comes up with. Um, the reason for the warming here is the Gulf of Maine is warming faster than 99% of the world's oceans, and it's because the reason the Gulf of Maine and Georgia's bank historically were so dynamic fishing grounds is because the intersection of the Labrador current from the Arctic with the Gulf Stream and upwalled all these nutrients, 
the phytoplankton, you know, the microalgae at the bottom of the food chain were very energetic and productive and just led to this kind of incredible profusion of fish. Now, with the warming Arctic, the Labrador current is losing steam, the Gulf Stream is moving further up into the Gulf of Maine, and the water is warming, and the phytoplankton are losing uh, energy. And by energy, I mean energy for the sun. The phytoplankton have chlorophyll, they get uh, energy from the uh, sun converted into oxygen, uh, and they absorb sun and CO2, convert it into oxygen, and um, become the bottom of the food chain. Um, the warming ocean uh, is forcing fish to the poles, you know, to the higher latitudes where it's colder. Warmer water holds less gas, so there's less oxygen. So fi fish have to work harder to get their food. They have to exert more energy at a time when it's harder for them to breathe. Um, so that's a downward spiral. Um, even though climate change is producing more storms, there's actually less um, uh, steady wind because the differential between the poles and the tropics is being reduced. And the, the lack of wind is reducing the upwelling of nutrients. So there's all these dynamic uh, interactions going on in the ocean now that are going to have some kind of um, unknown, well, some known, but many unknown long-term effects. Um, so the good news is, there are two good pieces of good news. One is that there have been very few marine extinctions. I think there are 15 in the last 500 years. Of course, th those are the ones that we know about. There's probably a lot of unknown ones in deep parts of the ocean. Uh, but it's the other good news is that most fish stocks will rebuild in 10 years if given protection. And now there's a big movement, as you probably have heard about, to create all these marine protected areas in the ocean, in the high seas, and also in the continental shelves. And there is some indication that that really is helping um, stocks rebuild. Some indication that it gives stocks the um, latitude or the um, protection to adapt to climate change. So um, that's a good news story. So I have tried to, in this book, rewrite the negative perceptions, the negative narrative, and give a positive narrative, or at least show the, the good stuff that's happening while recognizing that there are problems out there. But, so, how's that to end? Good? Yeah. Um, uh, well, thank you very much. Okay. So who would like to ask the first question? Okay. I just wanted to ask about um, the status of the observer programs, especially in this area. Oh, on boats? Yeah. Yeah, she's asking about um, the status of human observers on fishing boats around here. Uh, I don't know the exact answer to that. Um, they, they're not on all boats, uh, but boats are required to take the observers. Uh, they're all trained as scientists. I mean, they're, they, don't, they're, they don't have graduate degrees, but they're trained be, as biologists before they go on the boats. Uh, there's a company in New Bedford called Blue Harvest. Does anyone know that? Um, which bought a lot of Carlos Rafael's boats and upgraded them, uh, retrofitted them. They're doing pilots with electronic monitoring. So you can see from the shore what is going on on the boat at sea, which, you know, I don't think a lot of fishermen are going to like or want, but um, Blue Harvest is bending over backwards to be um, uh, transparent, partly because they bought a lot of Raphael's boats, I think. Uh, okay, any other questions? And I'm going to add to that answer by, I belong to a list serve called MarMam, which means marine mammals. Every week I see ads for training for onboard of observers, especially for marine mammals. Yeah, and I don't, I you know that's more for marine mammals, but I'm guessing there's almost as many for just watching fish coming through the boats. All right, who's next? I had a question about the Gulf of the Gulf of Mexico uh, dead zone, how that's been tracked 
in, is it expanding? Uh, any way to shrink it? Um, I don't know that much about where is where is that dead zone? It's the mouth of the Mississippi. Oh, the mouth the of Mississippi. Of yeah. Yeah. Oh, right. Okay, I know what you're talking about. I don't. Yeah, I, got, I went outside your sphere of. Uh, yeah, because I, I was focusing. Uh, yeah, I don't know about that in particular. But one thing I will say about dead zones is they do make good places for farm for fish farms because you're not competing with wild fish. And there's one in uh, Panama called uh, Ocean Blue Cobia. Uh, and the guy who started that is a great story, Brian O'Hanlon. He started growing red, uh, red snapper in his basement in Long Island when he was a kid. And now he's got Cobia fish farm. But he's in a, basically an ocean desert where there's no marine life, no competition. But I, anyway, I don't. Maybe someone else knows about the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. Nope. I think the next question is from over here. And so, can you talk a little bit more about the QR code and how that's helping keep track of fish? Yeah. Uh, Anne asked about the QR code and how that's helping to track the fish. Uh, there are two. What? It's like Bitcoin. <laughs> Well, there, yeah, that's part. Well, what, part of it is a blockchain. Part of it is tracing with this through blockchain from the boat to the processor to the distributor to the retailer, etc. And all that's captured in kind of this immutable data flow that can't be changed. And at retail, you can put you can look on a uh, QR code and see all that. If you go in this thing called No Software, which is a fairly new company in New Bedford uh, that is selling direct to consumers, you can look in their, um, their, their fish that they're selling online and you can see the blockchain um, data. It's like uh, hieroglyphics. So that's one way, and I can't really explain how that works because to me it seems like it's still possible for people to um, produce mischief in the middle of the chain somehow. But the other way is just the, the Red's best way is a QR code that tells a story about the boat and the fishermen that is really pretty powerful because it connects you know, the producer to the consumer. And um, if you have a trusted purveyor like Red's Best, you don't really care about the blockchain. You say, we know he's doing a good job, so. Uh, well, see, this is, yeah, this is a, do you want to repeat the question? Oh, she wants to know about the blockchain. You may be a better explainer than me. Uh, it's a way of, it's a, it's a way of encoding data so that no one can change it. So it, it's put in this, this, um, uh, database chain and we're tracking uh, a product through the supply chain, no one can change the data. It's immutable. What I don't really understand is why you couldn't take a tag at some point and slap it on another bag of fish or something. So I don't know enough about that, but it is immutable. And um, if Chris Resendez were here, he could explain this. Some of you know Chris Resendez. Uh, Pat, and then uh, Jim. Hi, Nico. My question is, you said that um, the United States only has 2% of sales for, in the world of fish, selling fish. Is, there, is that because of policies that we have? And is there going to be any improvement in the future? Oh, the United States. She's wondering about the um, percent of... Uh, Fish, farm fish. Uh, the U.S. has, uh, I think, 1% of the global farmed fish. Uh, most of the farm fish, 60% are fresh water. They're like carp, tilapia, catfish and stuff, which I didn't really focus on. Um, but the, the U.S., not only does it have the second most biggest o ocean territory in the world, it has more land underwater than above water, which is a... Um, you might go in jeopardy and win a prize if you with that question, you know, answering that question properly. <laughs> Jim. I believe I read that uh, New Bedford has the highest uh, 
income from fisheries of any port in the United yes. States. Correct. So what proportion of that is freshwater fit, fresh water to the market, I mean fresh, fresh fish to the market versus uh, value added uh, products like uh, breaded fish and frozen oh. fish and stuff like that. You have right. an idea? Uh, we got beautiful fresh fish here. Right. Uh, Jim is asking, um, you know, New Bedford is the top value fishing port in the U.S. He said what percentage of that is from just fresh raw fish versus uh, breaded fish or um, prepared fish. Um, I, 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 think the, um, I think it's all, that figure, that top landing is based on landings. It's not on value add afterwards. It's like, it's like the, the landings at the dock and the, the price at auction, what they're getting for the fish. I'm pretty sure that is the case. I would like to know uh, where 3D farming stands in this area. 3D? Yeah, where you have your uh, mussels, your oy oysters, your scallops, your mussels, and your kelp. Yes. You, you touched on it a little bit, but oh, you didn't... I know. I th so, Where does that stand in this area? Um, she, she is asking about 3D farming, which is, are you talking about Bren Smith? Do you know him? Yeah, you know Bren Smith. Uh, 3D, she's talking about multi-trophic farming, where you do um, um, grow different species together. Uh, the, the classic form, the Chinese, the Asian form of multi-trophic is you get fed fish with extractive fish or greens. So you're feeding fish and they're pooping and the greens are taking the nutrients and it's like a holistic cycle. Uh, in Maine now, there's a lot of uh, shellfish and kelp farms together because the kelp absorbs CO2, which allows the shellfish to build their shells stronger and faster and, and put their energy into growing the meats. Uh, she's asking specifically about uh, this guy, Bren Smith, right? in uh, Thimble Islands, New Haven. He was one of the cod fishermen in uh, no uh, Newfoundland who was put out of work as a teenager and is now turned into what he calls a climate farmer. He's growing uh, mussels, oysters, scallops, and seaweed, kelp, together. I don't, he's, he doesn't have any fish. But he calls himself a climate farmer because it's, all this stuff is good for the ocean, restorative, and he used to be embarrassed by that. He wrote a great book, by the way, called Eat Like a Fish, which is his kind of life story, a very good read. So um, that's the main one I know about, but in Maine, there are a lot of experiments um, with scallops, oysters, mussels, and kelp. What about here? Here, no, it's not happening here, but you know, New Bedford has allocated 8,400 acres uh, for uh, fish farming, including Clark's Cove here. 8,400 acres is open. There's one, I think Dale Levitt, I don't know if people, anyone knows Dale Levitt, he's got a uh, permit for a pilot over uh, outside the hurricane barrier for an oyster farm, he, which I think he started. It's a deep water oyster farm, so the boats, it doesn't interfere with boat traffic. But there's not, what you're talking about, I don't think is really happening around. I, I don't know if the water here is cold enough for kelp because uh, it likes cold water. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah, that's a good point. You're true. I don't. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Emmy. <laughs> so I know this is a science group, but I have a question about your writing process. So, like, how much time did you spend researching this? What kind of filters did you use in terms of what, what's really going to make the book and not make the book, and then kind of time spent writing? Uh, so Emmy, who is a good writer and editor herself, is asking about the writing process and um, how I did it and how I decided what to keep or not keep. Well, I spent about five years on this off and on. I started out to do a global study about where are the fish going to come from to feed the world. I then realized that it was too much to take on, so I focused on New England, especially because I was writing it during the lockdown and pandemic, so it was, travel was impossible. Um, how did I decide what 
to keep or not. I really look for, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a marine biologist, I'm not a fisherman. So I look for people whose stories I could tell. And um, uh, this, this is regulators, um, fishermen, uh, and scientists. And I looked for just interesting people with interesting stories that were kind of change makers, you know, people who were doing something like the stuff Stokesbury is doing is unbelievable, I think. And um, uh, Bren Smith, unbelievable. Uh, Jared Auerbeck, Red's Best. There's some people doing amazing things, They're very entrepreneurial. So I, I really, because my background in writing was like Inc. Magazine and, and entrepreneurship and so uh, and innovation and technology, all those things really appeal to me. So that's what I was looking for, really. Any other questions? My question is, in consideration of everything that you've shared today, so, um, you know, what would be sort of the better starting point for a community like New Bedford? Should we invest in the future and hold off for 10 or 15 years and really focus on policy for regeneration of ocean fish, um, or should we make investments in aquaculture? Um, and if we choose the latter option, what are the implications for climate impacts? Thank you. She is asking for a place like New Bedford, should, is a matter of policy, should the city focus on wild fish and put other futuristic things like aquaculture on hold, or should the city promote and get into aquaculture? And I mean, the city has already answered that because they are promoting it. Uh, and I would say it's a good thing. Fishermen don't like the idea, but the fact of the matter is that they're not harvesting wild oysters, so they shouldn't worry about oysters being grown. And um, it is, not only is it a good source of food, it's a good source of, uh, uh, it's good business. I mean, there's obviously got to be a limit to the number of oyster farms that markets can withstand. But, and the other thing I think is we should try to emulate the, ice, the Iceland ocean cluster more and figure out what can we do with wild fish to use the 40% that we're throwing overboard? What can we do with that? What kind of business, what kind of products can we create out of that? And um, so I think we should jump into the future, yeah, fast. <laughs> so in a, my speculation regarding those 8,400 acres in New Bedford that have, are available for aquaculture, I think the reason why there hasn't been this hungry uptake is because something called the Khmer War. And luckily with the EPAs coming in, they're gonna clean up the harbor but people might be afraid of the meroir of the oysters in the bed. <laughs> but the, um, I, there are other opportunities for aquaculture for, the, for um, products that aren't things you could eat. So kelp, as they were referring, talking about earlier, has been shown to clean and um, alleviate climate impacts in the ocean. And there, what is, what, um, what, what kind of products do you think would make sense to grow from kelp? And do you think there's a, how would we go about building that supply chain in New Bedford? Right. <laughs> okay. Uh, she says that one of the reasons the people have not been jumping all over these 8,400 acres for farming is because we're, they're worried about the inner, the meroir, the, you know, which is the, ocean equivalent of terroir where wine is grown. Um, uh, they're worried about the inner harbor and she's worried about the, the people aren't farming out here even though the city wants them to because they're worried about the meroir, the quality of the water from the inner harbor, that the, the toxic waste that is... Uh, the EPA is, I think they've um, done um, tests outside the hurricane barrier and opened it up for, that's why there's a uh, oyster farm there. And she also wonders about kelp as being good for the environment and what kind of products can be created from kelp. So I have a chapter in the book called Kelp um, for Food, Fuel, and Pharma. So 
It's being used for food. There's kelp burger. There's kelp jerky. There's kelp. There's kelp um, sushi. You know, there's all kinds of uses for kelp. And some people talk about feeding the world with kelp, but I don't think that's going to happen. But it wouldn't take. People say you could, if you did something the size of Washington State and turn it into a kelp farm, you probably could feed most of the world if they wanted to eat kelp. Um, but there's some, far, there's some very interesting pharmaceutical products that are being created from kelp. Um, uh, in particular, Icelandic or Norwegian kelp has got a certain um, uh, alginate that is very useful for anti-reflux and other things. Uh, and there's a huge um, Department of Energy uh, grant to study kelp f for biofuels. Woods Hole is a big part of that, University of Connecticut. There's a guy at University of Connecticut whose nickname is Dr. Seaweed, who I write about in the book. Um, so, um, it, yeah, they're, they're looking to, the Department of en Energy is trying to figure out if they can grow at scale l large amounts of kelp offshore and turn it into biofuel. So, Kelp, kelps are mostly uh, grown for the cow oil, and harvested for cow oil. For cows? Oh, ice cream for oh well uh, for oh that's right. It, yeah, well, no, it, it it reduces methane in cows, but uh, Jim is saying that it's also good in ice cream as a uh, additive in ice cream, but which is true. Yeah, that is true. Yeah. Yeah. So, I'm going to ask the last question, but before I do that, I want to remind you, his new book is called The Blue Revolution, and if and if you're interested. That's what it looks like. So in a recent interview, so we've talked, you talked a little bit about the changing temperature of the ocean. It's increasing and it's causing species to move. One of the species that's moved is black sea bass. And you mentioned this in an interview, how black sea bass have moved, but the regulations and the quotas related to that up here haven't changed yet. I'm right. So the, Mid-Atlantic boats have the quotas. This area up here does not, but I'm wondering, are there other species like that in that category? Uh, well, there are definitely other species that are moving uh, north. Squid is one. I mean, the Rhode Island boats, big squid, uh, they've been going down the Mid-Atlantic to get squid. Squids are now up in the Gulf of Maine. Uh, so I don't know if New Bedford boats have quota for squid or if they want it. Um, uh, other fish. Uh, scup is moving up. That's a big fish now, but I, I don't. I, that's more of a s small boat thing. I don't see that as a big New Bedford um, uh, item. So uh, I don't really know. I'd say the the main one would be squid to watch squid because squid is a you know potentially valuable uh, stock. All right. Well, so thank yeah. you so much. Thank you, Ann. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, uh, Cable Access. <laughs> right, thank you all for being here. Feel free to sign up. Otherwise, we have a Facebook page. We have a website, New Bedford Science Cafe. And we'll see you in September. And thank you, Cisco.